<laughs> okay, thank you for coming. Glad to see you all. And um, you're here for a purpose to talk about with me, design for small spaces as a um, theme. And that's a nice title. The fact is that the, even if it were a large space that you're designing, um, the, the best way to do that is to uh, make it into a bunch of small spaces <laughs> and, and make them cohesive so that you have a design that works. Unless you're doing some kind of a state around an English castle or something like that. Have you ever been to the Huntington Botanic Gardens? It's big, right? Kind of, you kind of get there and you don't know where to go. You, you, you go in the gate, you go through a few gardens and past the gift shop and they got restaurants and stuff now on their new entrance. And then it's just, here's, you know, 170 acres of or whatever it is, of garden with a sign, palms, cactus, art yeah. library, Japanese, one of the Japanese and the Chinese gardens both work and the children's garden and the conservatory, which are all fairly new, not the Japanese garden, that's very old. The Chinese garden, the children's garden, the conservatory are fairly new and they all work because they have a, a boundary and they essentially are small gardens within the bigger garden. And once you get into the Chinese garden or the Japanese garden, it's like, yeah, I can relate. And the same with the conservatory, which of course is a greenhouse. And then, but the rest is just this vast place. I just only use that as an example because um, we like small spaces. Okay, we like to be able to relate. Um, I read a story about kids with their family at the Grand Canyon, you know, it's like the emblem of nature. And they stopped at one of the overlooks and they were supposed to all, you know, take in the Grand Canyon. And these kids are down on the ground, hands and knees on the, under the little bench, you know, playing with a, with a beetle, an ironclad beetle. And the parents were, hey, here, we came all the way to the Grand Canyon to see this the site and the kids were enamored with nature but at their scale at their level it's in a book called the geography of childhood the point is we're like kids and there's certain spaces and sizes we can't really relate to like the Grand Canyon is so huge it seems like it's not even there when you look at it so design for small spaces is almost redundant because look at the hummingbird theme to the spice to, the, to that um, just this year just now that plant doesn't live there, okay? That plant just got there a half hour ago, and that's okay. The hummingbird will find it. You plant them, they'll find it. It's kind of a process of thinking, okay? So we'll just get right into the design aspect of it. And I believe that there are two kind of branches to, to garden design, and I'm gonna call one artificial. one natural or naturalistic okay all gardens are natural you would say because they have natural plants live plants but let's talk about design being both artificial so artificial design would be very contrived it would be um, a typical modern garden in front of a glass building in town. It would be a, uh, a formal symmetrical herb garden, Shakespeare garden. It would be a uh, um, uh, most of what you see in in new housing tracts everywhere you go, even on slopes that should have natural design. We're seeing more and more. Um, artificial design uh, shapes and lines and textures that are contrived and and kind of over conspicuous and um, far from natural and if that was in fact the purpose if that was the stated purpose to make a, a statement using um, uh, art elements that, that are they all come from nature. I mean, if you have a stone bench, I mean a concrete bench, it's reminiscent of a, of a sitting 
place that would be a stone. It all comes from nature in the beginning, but if, if the stated purpose is to have a garden design that is um, not natural, in other words, it, it, it's, it's the, the, the symmetrical fountain and the concentric rings with benches and flower beds out to a perfectly round wall, and the whole narrative of that is you are in a controlled and designed and tidy place outdoors. That's an okay statement. As long as you make it from the start, you say, I am, I am going to design an artificial <laughs> space. Um, and, they, and there are native plants that will work for that, obviously. All plants are native somewhere, so some of the California native plants can be used quite effectively in what I'm calling artificial design. But I don't think you're here to talk about that today with me because we're at Tree of Life Nursery and it's surrounded by wherever we do have a garden, it is natural design. And we've brought in the best of nature and tried to make it fit into a garden. So that's what we'll talk mostly about. But again, the artificial design, all of this comes from um, and this is really key to any design, is what is your narrative? What is the story that you're trying to tell? When Disneyland opens a new land, <laughs> Star Wars land is coming up pretty quick, they have a storyboard. They have a narrative. And it goes right down to every detail. The colors, the font they use on the signs, the obviously the planting as well. In Bugs World at Disneyland, you may not have noticed, and I've only been through there a few times, and I really don't even know what Bugs World is. I think it's a movie, but there's huge plants and big leaves and overhead um, canopy trees and mostly exaggerated leaf size, and it's supposed to make you feel like you're a bug in this mass of vegetation. Okay, that was the narrative that they wrote before they designed it. Okay, so you and I, when we're designing a garden, should write a narrative. What's the story that this garden is going to tell? So start with a narrative. And if your narrative is nature, natural, like we're talking about today, then I think that there are kind of three branches to that that, that make sense. And one would be stylized. Buy a yeah, and then and then I would so I'd call it stylized, and then I would call it um, over here would be wild, and and then this one could just be like let's just call it rustic, okay? And these are degrees. So stylized is probably uh, most people could really identify with this because it's going to look like nature, but we're going to polish it a little bit and trim it and pretty it up and, and, and bring in a look that matches the rest of the neighborhood and always looks pretty uh, to the eye that is used to looking at gardens. Rustic becomes more crude and has sort of a ranch kind of old flavor to it, a little bit more dirt, more dust, some rail fences and that, that's, that's a theme. And then wild would be a great theme, too, as well, but it might not go with the two neighbors on either side so well because we're talking about really a native plant look that is attempting to look as wild as possible, which is, again, a really great theme, but be careful with it because it might, in contrast to everything else around, look, uh, people won't get it. Does that make sense? It also okay. depends on whether you have a really strict arch jury and an association. Yeah, yeah, it's if you have the, the high priestess yeah. of, of, the high um, priestess of land. <laughs> landscape that rules your neighborhood, you might not even get away with stylized because it's still kind of natural and, and, and uh, unusual. But so, so, so these are the, the, we could also divide up artificial, but that's another expert and another topic and another idea. But it would be like modern, old, traditional symmetry, symmetry, and 
um, and who knows what else, you know, and sort of uh, functional, you know, like a rose garden, a herb garden, a fruit orchard, you know, these things would fit into this artificial um, and, and, you know, traditional being the, the Shakespearean symmetry, the modern being the austere, which are really cool gardens, um, uh, Zen style, but very, very artificial, sort of borrowing from nature with a lot of interpretation and then functional. Maybe it would be the, um, the fruit trees and things like that. And so, so once, you, once you've made the, this um, uh, uh, decision, let's just stick with stylized for today, okay? So, and the, the reason why this works and, and what we said in the, in the um, um, description of today's talk is that one of the key examples of this um, theme is the Japanese garden, okay? Now, there's some great ones here in America. There's one close by at the Huntington Botanic Gardens. Uh, there's a great one in Portland. Uh, and then San Francisco, mm -hmm, in Golden Gate. Fantastic one in Golden Gate. The, cl the climate in Portland and San Francisco is absolutely perfect for these gardens. And then, of course, in Japan, for instance, Kyoto. So here's what the Japanese people did centuries ago and have become world famous for it in their gardens. Now check this out, this is tricky. They used Japanese native plants in Japan, brought them into a small space setting, used a lot of symbolism and other features, including pruning, which miniaturizes things, to make it look like nature, stylized. So essentially, the Japanese garden is a native plant garden in Japan with natural stylized decisions. Sometimes you could say almost over the top stylized because of the centuries and centuries to build this tradition to where a stone lantern represents a town, a little bridge, a stream, a reflecting pond, um, rocks. Did you know that in the Japanese garden, the, 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 they're usually pretty small, five acres is a big public garden as far as Japanese gardens is concerned, and even two acres is enough, and, and I'm talking public gardens, and they, they have very sinuous paths that, that um, are, you think you're farther away than you just were a little while ago because of the curves and the shrubbery and the trees and the obstacles that make you, you don't realize that you and I are this far apart, but I had to walk clear over there and back around here to get to you um, because of obstacles, hedges, trim trees, mounds of soil, lakes, rivers. So the, the paths both carry you through the experience and they're by design not smooth surface, not perfectly smooth surface. They have they vary as you go. They have, all this we should be picking up as far as how to do it in California. We won't use the same materials and the exact same methods, but we will use the same principles. So these paths vary stone to brick to concrete that's brushed. The edging is different. The width is different. Not like a crazy quilt um, hodgepodge where you don't have any continuity, but enough to make you Go slow is the idea. You you are not supposed to run through a Japanese garden. You're supposed to slow down, and part of the way they get you to slow down is with stepping stones that you've got to land on, or surfaces that aren't perfectly smooth that you've got to be a little bit careful as you walk. In many places, of course, there's a lot of water, moisture, um, rain, etc., and so the surfaces are safe. They're they're not smooth and and dangerous or slick, but where they're not going to trip you, but they're not perfect and they're not super wide and and they're not, um, for all intents and purposes, they're not designed to be sort of functional, get you from point A to point B. They're functional to get you to slow down and experience the garden. So this is a really cool key point for the California garden. 
the Japanese garden also has a, an entrance. It has a gate. As a general rule, it's a very prominent, you know, big, ornate, marked entrance. Big doors and, you know, roof line and pillars and things like that that, that say, come on in. <laughs> It's not a gate that says stay out. It's a gate that says once you're in, it's a different place than where you just came from. See, this is another garden principle for small space. You were in town, now you're in a garden. Golden Gate Park was built for this reason. Central Park in, Los in, in New York was built for this purpose, to get people out of the soot and grime of the city into a place they could breathe and relax and heal can be made well. These are the real reasons for gardens. The walled garden of, of Britain is a space that was designed to be entirely different from everything else out there. And, and it's given the name, the walled garden, which, which you go into. It's kind of a bummer for everybody else that can't get in, like all the peasants. <laughs> but just the same, if you had a privilege to go inside the walled garden, you're in an amazing Hamlet there, paradise, just a, just a great experience. So gardens were meant, are meant to be experiences. So this takes us to our, our small space. How do you make the small space garden more than just a, a decorated uh, outdoor place, but an actual experience? And this is the key to, to that, and that is to be invited in. You, want, you have to have you know, an invitation. And that is only done by stuff that is intriguing. Okay, you gotta, you got, so you gotta have some treasures. Now, the thing about turf, a lot of the gardens that we're planting now and are being um, designed and and made in the last few years have been to replace turf. Okay, which is a great thing, and because useless turf, that is turf that nobody uses to enjoy. Kids don't play on it. Dogs. Nobody sits out there in patio furniture. Those are good uses for turf. But turf just sitting there with no purpose is a waste of water and resources, and we've come to realize that, and, and everybody accepts it, and they're taking out turf. One of the advantages, of, though, of turf is, though, by definition, you can go anywhere you want. I mean, if there's a big turf area, like in the 70s were built, a lot of these mounding turf spots with some shade trees and some benches outside office parks. and people would you take their lunch or their breaks out there. And it was cool, you know, they, they needed the fresh air, they'd get out of the office, the fluorescent lights, and go out and sit on the lawn, even on college campuses, same thing. Big areas of mowed grass under shade trees, and people can enjoy it. And in Southern California, the cost was water, fertilizer, runoff, maintenance, noise, pollution. Um, taking the clippings to the dump. I mean, it was a big resource drain, but it, but the trade-off was people could go anywhere they wanted and enjoy the space. One of the, if you go to a really cool succulent garden, Sherman Gardens in Corona del Mar, very small, intense succulent garden. The Huntington, of course, Wrigley Botanic Garden in Avalon, the Malibu Estate at, at, at the Getty, parts of the Getty up in Bel Air. Um, there's, but these gardens, by the way, these succulent gardens that are kind of famous, are by design ultra weird, okay? It's kind of like snorkeling over a coral reef. It's otherworldly. I come in from that and I gotta go sit down and think, God, am I still on Earth? That experience is so out of the, my sensory capabilities that I have to sort of debrief that everything's still okay because coral reefs are really reefs are really weird and all the fish and everything. So that's what the succulent garden is. When you go to a really good succulent garden, you're blown away. But we don't need that everywhere. That's that's a, an experience that you kind of save for this moment called succulent garden. So a well-designed and beautifully maintained succulent garden is a is a work of art and it's a, mm. and it's experience of itself. And it might be your story, but it's it's completely artificial. It would fit into this category of, of weirdness. And if you go to um, Lotus Land in Montecito, which is a botanic garden that was created by a very eccentric woman 
back in the 20s and is now open to the public, docent led um, um, uh, access. Uh, it's as eccentric and as weird as you can get. There's a blue garden. There's a garden with these gigantic clam shells as, as the features. There's a psychid garden. There's a, a cactus garden. There's a bunch of, there's a garden where a bunch of gnomes, you know, these little stone guys made out of sandstone. And they're all coming from all around, out in the hedges and up on the hill. And they're all coming down as if they were going to come to a play because there's a little platform down there, which is the stage. And they're all, That's a, oh, it's unbelievable. And they are the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they are the show. It's, there's, it, she was, you know, Madam uh, Ganowalska, she, she was um, um, quite the person, right? There was, there was a period in her life when she asked that her gardeners wore tuxedos to work outside. So she had, she had an idea. She had, talk about a narrative. You know, there is a narrative. She had it. She got it. I'm telling stories here. And, and, and it's, it sounds like the whole property is theater. Yeah, it is. It really. Is. She was. She was. She was in theater. Even the name. What was it, Madam? Gan Ganowalska. I mean, come on. Yeah, I think she was opera. <laughs> I was going to opera. say. So she had. She had um, uh, these these surfaces that you walk on that are that are each each one is a work of art to this day, and the things that they've added since her death and as part of the public are in the same tradition. They they haven't lost it, and so it's, it's worth a visit. Anyway, it's an experience. It asks you in, it's highly art artificial, it's got a succulent garden that's amazing and succulents here and there because Santa Barbara, you can do that. So I, I just add that as a side note, I'm not slamming succulents, but I am having to say that the, the cheap and uh, uh, un, no thinking um, use of succulents has made for ugly landscapes in the last few years in, in Southern California. So back to this garden experience with the invitation. So in order to get this, I'm just talking about principles here because this is a brief little, little class on, on, on design in small spaces. Now what I like to do is when you have a, a space, you know, of, of, for your garden, and you've got a story, and, and if your story is, in this case, I've brought in some plants that are, that are going to work together. So we're going to tell a story of a, um, uh, uh, Desert, a coastal desert. Um, oasis. Okay, so that's the theme. That's the title of this garden that we're going to design here. Okay, and it's a small garden. It's a little patio, and it's got a lot of sun. And we chose this because of the site itself. Lots of bright light, lots of sun. Maybe not the greatest air circulation. A little further inland, uh, not desert per se but but warm and sunny and the architecture is uh, Spanish style stucco not fancy but just got tile roof got the white plaster um, some big beam patio cover kind of a classic look that that um, would you could find in a tract home or in a custom home in Southern California and start with this narrative you need a theme and you need a title, so that so that before you can you can change the title, but but if you define a theme, and if the theme comes from an ecological, from ecology, okay, a plant community, a region, an assemblage of plants, now you you've got not only the the, the plants, but the look that you're gonna you're going to achieve. Um, this has to fit into the um, the environment. I mean, if you say you define your your theme, your ecology based on a plant community, and the ones that I brought up today are because we're in the middle of summer. So th this is something that you could actually pull off if you were doing it today, okay? Because these plants don't mind warm season handling, whereas many of the native plants from cooler climates, those from the north part of the state or elsewhere, probably be better to wait till fall to, to do your planting just only a couple months away. As a grower, I look two, three months out and say, hey, that's right around the corner. So we're in mid-July, by mid-September, 
it's, it's a new game. Days are shorter, nights are cooler. Coming in on October, perfect time to plant. And rains follow after that. You can't go wrong. These warm, grow, warm season growers are easy to use in the summer. So I brought them for that reason, also to make this hypothetical that these people, even though they live, let's say, right here in Yorba Linda or Mission Viejo or Poway or some, you know, not the desert per se, but coastal enough to still get these, these kind of moisture in the air, but inland enough to get some heat, could have a cool little patio garden that has desert plants. So they've got their theme, they've got their, their story, which is coastal desert oasis, and now they need, out here in this, in this uh, map, they need treasures. So you need to have, you need, you know, I don't sell these treasures, I sell plants. I haven't really got to the plants yet, so I don't know if you can tell this is really about plants. Well, it is, of course it is. But what are the treasures? So you have to write in your story, and the story should be a paragraph, a narrative, a couple paragraphs, whatever. Just get a piece of paper out. Can't start start writing down the names of treasures. So what do you want? Let's 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 be this 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 family. What do they want? They want a table with chairs. Okay, small table, two chairs. Okay, just a couple. They want a hammock. I was going to say hammock. Okay, I'm going to put hamaca <laughs> in Spanish. They want a hammock. Okay, what else do they want? They want fire a, pit. A, a fire pit. Yeah, they they would outdoors. They're gonna they're gonna make this like a little camping experience. Okay. So they want their their, their 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 fire pit. That's it. And and well, let's let's they're they're just rowdy enough to where this is going to have wood fires. They're going to actually not some funky gas fire. They're going to build a little fire, a little campfire right outside. Okay. Maybe they'll want a water feature probably for the sound. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll need a fountain. Or a babbling something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the so water. Okay. And we'll get to it. So that's excellent. And that's really key to desert gardens. That every dry climate in the world has <laughs> tried their best to have a real or some way to get gravity water into the patio so that it would have enough head on it to push up and make a fountain before it went on. And in most cultures from ancient times, that fountain was also a source for to come get water, but it was definitely a um, ornamental feature to cool the area and to cool the senses. Okay, so we've got table, two chairs, hammock, fire pit, water, water fountain. That's a pretty good little outdoor patio. Okay, so we need shade for sure. Okay, so let's just, I've never really done this before. Okay. So let's just take this out. So as you're telling your story, you've got this, you're telling a story, which is the narrative, and you need your treasures. So the treasures are the things that we just listed. So you've got this big area, which is your yard, and, and the, you only, the way I like the table and chairs out here, you have, let's, you know, the fountain is, right here's a window, so let's, 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 let's call it a fountain that, that sits right here in the middle, you know, that, that, that works. Um, the herb garden should be as close as possible to the kitchen. The herb garden should be close to the kitchen, so that's a treasure. You've got your herb garden, you've got the, the hammock out here, you've got the fountain. So, so you've got the table, what else did we have? Um, okay, so that's so far all the treasures that we, that we had uh, listed. But you could also have um, an occasional potted plant or something like that, which could come later. But the point is this, you have this small space, and you don't know what to do with it, and you and, it, and, and how do I start? You start with, we've already gone through it all. Uh, define the theme, tell a story, make a title, put some treasures out there. Now, as you connect the treasures with paths, because this is all just dirt, okay? And we want plants. Remember, it's not turf, where you could walk anywhere. But we, so, so you, you have, you need, you need this to have its own little, little uh, semi-permeable hard space. This thing can, let's, ha let's make this fountain just come out of the garden. Maybe it connects up to the, to the thing like, like this. You can go over and, and look at it. The herb garden is its own garden. Let's put in a, the, um, 
a little uh, ranch style uh, split rail fence. So you could do like a raised stone that also served as seating? Raised stone that served as seating. And bring up your garden, it's easier to pick. Let's change that to raised stone that served, oh. serves as seating. Okay. I like that. Okay, so this, and then you could even have a couple layers of that. Mm -hmm. so, that so that this garden is, is built up in such a way that there's terracing down to where this is a foot higher than this, is a foot higher than this, or something. So it's just slightly higher than grade, allowing for, for viewing it, and then a couple stepping stones up into it where you can go up and pick the herbs, okay? And now you gotta use these stones elsewhere. So somewhere down here, there's a little stone wall or something that, that picks it up so you don't have this, so you have some continuity, okay? So you've, you've added some, some elements already. You've got, um, so, so you've chosen, um, in this, to connect these, this uh, out the door to this table, a path, which is submerged, the other end of it is in the water, and you can hear a musical note every time the drip hits the, hits the surface of the water, and you stand, and you kind of crouch down, actually, and your friend is doing it too, and you're sort of looking, you, it's just this experience, the weirdest thing, right? And you do it until you don't do it anymore, and then you get up and mock on, but it's there! to cause you to slow down and <laughs> listen to the drip of water hit the surface of the sea. It's the coolest thing. Is the length of the bamboo chain? I wonder. I, I don't know. It's a really good, a good idea. Something, so you you're not submerging the car in. You're dancing it just above the water? No, it's in the water. It's in yeah, the water? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It hasn't came that. back. So, so what are... So the treasures connected by, you know, paths. Now that's your treasure map. Okay, and the treasures and are the features for all intents and purposes, for lack of a better uh, term. And then, and then this. So, so then you end up with in, within your theme. got the, um, the plants coming up. Okay. So, so when this, this becomes a materials list. And so does this. So there has to be some continuity in both. This, this has to have Okay, stone, concrete pavers, um, the fountain, you know, the table, the chairs, this, this, and these have to have some continuity, some, they have to blend, you know, they have, it has to look pretty, aesthetic, this is your own taste involved here, it's like decorating a room, right, you don't have early American and modern and, you know, Victorian and strange, you know, hodgepodge of furniture. I mean, you can, but it's gonna look crazy. Same here. You 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 have this materials list all match up, and this all has to match up. And we haven't really talked in this because we're talking design, okay? But as part of the design, back in the at, at the start, in in this um, whole thing, there has to be um, you know function. We talked about the human use of the of the site, but you also have to, in today's world, um, take the rainwater off your roof. Use a rain chain, a rain barrel would be ideal. Have the garden graded in such a way that there's a swale. The swale has basins in it that becomes, if it works into your design, a dry stream bed. But when it rains water is channeled into that swale it actually collects in the basins and soaks into the ground that gives you an idea once you've dug this little swale with these basins in the garden it's subtle but you have you just scared up a bunch of dirt now you've got mounds <laughs> little mounds off to the side they become um, places to place boulders and rocks this might be another part of your features might be some of your 
your um, material in the, in the material way. Boulders, rocks, stones, cobble. Um, then you know you're, you're, you're making decisions here on what's what's here. Rock. What is the path? Um, pavers. Always know some decomposed granite. Remember it's rustic. What color are the pavers? Red, brick red, like fired fired brick matches the the roof tile. I'm just making up things here for the sake of this this um, design, but I'm, I'm hoping that we're, we're we're sort of bifurcating all these decisions down to a simple materials list in both cases. So once now we're going to get to the plants and finish up. Once now that we've got the um, ground, we figured out how to make it efficient, both for us to be able to use it and for rainwater to soak in and to be a, a viable uh, landscape garden, then we can go shopping. <laughs> we can start looking for plants. And so someone said once that the best um, Italian food dinner has Simple is good, but less is more, especially if you're starting out. Gardens are never completely finished. You can come back all through time and add plants and kind of detail, and depending on your original theme, um, stylize it more or make it more rustic. I've got a friend that had a truly wild garden in Laguna Niguel, and he would cart big old rotten, you know, wood pieces of logs, you know, sycamore oak out of wherever he could find it, had lots of acorn woodpecker holes in it, beetles and insects crawling out of it, didn't matter, he'd throw it in his car and stick it in his garden, okay, and he was creating habitat, he was creating a look, he'd go right outside and he'd look like he was just come out of his tent on a camping trip, this is, it, it was in Laguna Niguel, he now lives in Talega, they probably want to throw him out. <laughs> but too bad. America, he's too busy. So, um, he's got a theme, and he's got, and he's adding continually. You would add to this theme, which we're going to build with the plants, but we've already built in our minds here, this little coastal desert patio. You go to Old Town in San Diego, and you get one of those Talavera iguanas, you know, and you stick it over there on the corner. You get a, a, one of those Talavera suns and it goes up on the white stucco. These are the, the additional little jewels that you can always bring in. Another little plant over here, a flowering plant there, some wildflower seed here. Oh, here's a cool bench. Let's take the old one out and put this one in. So you're never through, you're never finished with the design and the garden, but you're always keeping in the original theme. One time, do you know the, the hotel in the Yosemite Valley called the Awani? it's called something else now. Unfortunately, they took the name Awani away. But it's the first class hotel that was built early part of the 20th century in order to attract very wealthy tourists into the Yosemite Valley so that they would buy into the national park idea. That's, that's why it was built. And it's an amazingly beautiful historic building. And, you know, they don't, they don't buy if they needed, if they need a waste basket for on the other side of the desk there at reception, it goes through some design criteria before they buy the waste basket, right? Because they've got this book that says no one's allowed to go buy a waste basket and stick it behind their desk. You've got to go through the right people. Why? Because it's a historic building that was designed by a famous architect that they've maintained that integrity to this day. So in your patio here, this coastal desert patio, you've got sort of a, um, what do they call it in architecture? What do they call it, a, isn't there a name for it? Uh, um, <laughs> they, well, there's a, they, they usually have a, a material board, and mm -hmm. so it would be a... a like design a, guidelines. Design guidelines. Design yeah. guidelines? Yeah. And you're not, you're not supposed to veer from those. Yeah. Once there, once this light fixture, this trash can, this drinking fountain, that bike rack has been chosen and selected. It's for a purpose. And you don't go on the cheap and get a different one. <laughs> because we chose this bike rack because it works with that lamp post. Is that right? That's kind of how it works. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and then it's the thing that makes you just 
say good job when you go into a restored building like that they've they've gone through every effort to find the right numbers that when they put the address back up on the house they are the right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah you know the inverse of that mm -hmm. is these charity um, the home tours where they'll take an old home that's been allowed to fall into disrepair mm -hmm. and they bring in a number of designers they assign every designer a space mm. and then when it's done they get it and they truly restore it because mm. every designer has a different theme in every room, and it makes you really crazy. If you I can imagine. If you're a design person, <laughs> yeah. it's like overstimulation. Oh yeah, no, it's like an. I mean, every room's okay as a, as a standalone. By itself, well, that's the way. That's the way some of the gardens that we see are nowadays. So if we have these plants, and we do, um, here's a plant from Mexico, which is a really neat flowering tree that we're starting to grow, not because it's California native, but because it's compatible and I love it. It's called Tababuya intetigenosa. So this is a pink flowering tree, mid-sized uh, tree. There's some old ones in Pasadena, and when you see one